Shalom, shalom. We're picking back up in our study of patron and client relationships. And today we're going to read from N.T. Wright, the New Testament and its world. And we'll find here on page 147, the social order. Social status was usually inherited through family descent and gender. All in an assumed ordered hierarchy. However, social advancement was possible and many pursued it vigorously by accumulation of wealth or by marriage, education, manumission from slavery and military exploits. All Romans belonged to one of the various social tiers of society, senatorial, equestrian, decurian, plebeian, freedman, and slave. Social ranking often determine who would interact with whom and on what terms. So we can understand why Shaul says there's no Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, or free. I'm paraphrasing, but we can understand now why he is saying this, because in Messiah, everyone was welcome to table fellowship. Social ranking often determine who would interact with whom and on what terms. This caused various conundrums for the early church or assembly committed as it was to living in a totally different way. So patronage and salvation in the New Testament. In order to give expression to supernatural or unseen realities, people in the ancient world used the language of everyday realities. The world beyond was understood by analogy to known quantities in the world at hand. The relationship between human and divine beings, cosmic inferiors and superiors, as it were, was expressed in terms of the closest analogy in the world of social interaction, namely patronage. So that we find talk of patron deities by individuals and groups. This holds true also for the way New Testament authors give expression to the relationship between the one God and the people of God. Even its use of family imagery connects with the image of the patron who brings a host of clients into the household, although now with the special status of daughters and sons, adoption. We're going to look at 2.1, God as patron. So the Hebrew scriptures speak of God as the patron of Israel who protects and provides for the people with whom God has formed this special relationship of favor. When Israel does not make the proper response, i.e. by failing to return honor, exclusive loyalty, and service in the form of obedience to Torah, God responds by punishing them. What is remarkable is God's loyalty to the relationship. Though the relationship is breached on one side, God never abandons the nation despite its ingratitude. Now, this punishment is more, you know, don't think about this harsh demiurge and things that Martian used to speak about. What we're seeing here is the same way that you chastise your children, like a father or a mother uh, chastises their son or daughter. So both the Jewish and Greco-Roman backgrounds lead the early church or the early assemblies to view God in a similar fashion. God is the patron of all. Since God has given to all the matchless gift of existence and sustenance, Revelation 4.11, God will be the benefactor for all who seek to seek and trust God's favor, Hebrews 11 and 6. God is celebrated as the patron whose favor and benefits are sought in prayer and whose favorable response to prayer is assured. The songs and the Lucan infancy narratives are primarily songs about God's patronage. They represent the response of gratitude to God for God's favor, but also describe God as the patron of the weak and the poor. A portrait that ties closely with Luke's overall emphasis on caring for the poor. God is also celebrated as the patron of Israel in both Mary's and Zechariah's song, for God has brought the help that the people have needed so desperately. God's favor is astonishing, not in that God gives freely or uncoerced. Every benefactor, in theory, at least did this. 
Rather, it is in God's determination to bring benefit to those who have affronted God in the extreme. God goes far beyond the high water mark of generosity set by Seneca, which was for virtuous people to consider even giving to the ungrateful if he had the resources to spare after benefiting the virtuous, to provide some modest assistance to those who have failed to be great in the past will be accounted a proof of great generosity. But God shows the supreme fullest generosity, giving his most costly gift, the life of his son. Towards those who are not merely ungrateful, but who have been actively hostile to God and God's desires. This is an outgrowth of God's determination to be kind, even towards the ungrateful and the wicked, Luke 6 and 35. Also, when we read uh, Luke's narrative and we see the naming of Yehokanan Hamikbil, it clearly tells you what Zechariah was actually praying. Uh, if you read all the way, the whole chapter, you'll see that the Amadah, is actually being prayed. If you do the Amidah, again, I have a video on Sidor. You should check it out because the Amidah is an ancient prayer. A second distinctive aspect of God's favor in God's initiative in affecting reconciliation with those who have affronted God's honor. God does not wait for the offenders to make an overture or to offer some token acknowledgement their own disgrace and shame in acting against God in the first place. Rather, God sets aside his anger in setting forth Jesus or Yeshua, providing an opportunity for people to come into favor and escape the consequences of having previously acted as enemies. Hence the choice of deliverance as a dominant image for God's gift. Tyria. Not all, however, honor God as the patron merits. Even the special covenant people have brought God's name into dishonor on account of disloyalty and disobedience. Nevertheless, God remains faithful to those whom he has benefited in the past, continuing to offer favor, even the gift of adoption into God's household for those who return to God in trust and gratitude. Those who persist in responding ungracefully to the divine patron, however, will ultimately face wrath. Next, we will look at Yeshua or Jesus as mediator. Shalom, shalom.